Welcome to a very normal therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll talk about the one sample t-test. We'll talk about what it is, why it's important, and we'll see how to implement it in code. If you're a new employee, my name's Christian and I'm a PhD student in biostatistics. The goal of this channel is to make statistics easier to understand so that you can better apply it to your career or daily life and stay informed. If my voice sounds different to you, I'm just feeling a little under the weather, so I'm sorry if that affects the voiceover a little bit too much. These are the main concepts and ideas that I'll discuss in this video. At the end, I'll create a network of these ideas to show you how I think about them and let you develop your own intuition. One of the main reasons that statistics is useful is that it lets us make data-driven decisions. Instead of just going with our gut, listening to the highest paid person's opinion, or just listening to some random dude on the internet, we can let the data guide our decisions instead. Data actually gives us a better sense of how the world actually works. One of the main ways that statisticians make data-driven decisions is through hypothesis tests. There's no shortage of criticism of frequentist hypothesis tests, and as someone who leans Bayesian, I get a little bit of nausea every time I do one, but the reality is, is that hypothesis tests are still important to know and understand. There are many types of hypothesis tests, but we'll start with the humble one sample t-test. Many of the concepts we'll learn here will apply to essentially all hypothesis tests, so we'll start to develop our own intuition by using the simplest version of one. Let's buckle in and get started with the training. Before we can understand the phrase one sample, we have to understand what a population is. In statistics, the word population has a very specific meaning. It is a group of items with similar qualities that we're interested in studying. One example of a population is the set of all people who consume YouTube content. Another example is the population of all patients diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Populations don't have to be human, but as a pharma company, humans are usually who we study. These two examples are distinct, but share something in common. You would agree with me that if we wanted to study these populations, it would be pretty hard, if not impossible, to gather data from everyone in these populations. By extension, we won't be able to learn any characteristics or qualities about this population. Instead, we collect data from a small subset of the population, which we call a sample. Intuitively, if we can learn something from the smaller sample, then what we learn shouldn't be too far off from the population they come from. Statistics lets us make this connection, and this is the task of statistical inference. Therefore, one sample problems are problems where we're interested in a single population, and by extension, one sample. With one sample problems, we're usually trying to research about a specific quality about the population. For the YouTube population, we might be interested in the average amount of time they watch YouTube in one day. For the population who has diabetes, we may be interested in the proportion of them who have a particular comorbidity, like obesity or high blood pressure. Before we go further, let's define some notation. What we're interested in is the population mean, which we'll denote as mu. We won't be able to calculate this directly, but this notation lets us represent this idea. Instead, we'll use the sample mean as an estimator, or guess, of the population mean. We can actually calculate the sample mean because we gather data from the sample. We assume that populations have some degree of randomness to them, and as a result, there could be a wide range of values that the sample mean could take, by virtue of the data itself being random. We'll start by learning a high-level overview of the method we'll be using to make data-driven decisions. After introducing this method, we'll dive into how the specific details of the one-sample t-test apply to this method. The method we'll be learning is called the Null Hypothesis Significance Testing Framework, which we'll just abbreviate NHST. This method was invented by Sir Ronald Fisher, one of the most prominent and controversial figures in statistics. In this context, a hypothesis is a statement that the world, or population, is a certain way. To be more precise, a hypothesis is a statement about the specific value that a population parameter takes. For example, if we believe that the average video watch time of someone who watches YouTube is 50 minutes, then we translate this into a hypothesis about the population mean being equal to 50. Statistical hypotheses can be about any population level parameter, including the variance, but for this video, we'll focus on the mean. Like its name suggests, this framework focuses on something called the null hypothesis, which we usually denote as H0. The null hypothesis can be thought of as the hypothesis that depicts the status quo, or 
something that we'd like to disprove. In the context of a one-sample problem, we may want to overturn this idea that the average YouTube watch time is 50 minutes. To disprove the null hypothesis, we need to collect actual data from the population we're interested in. We typically condense all of this data into a single number, which we call a test statistic. If you can recall from one of the last training videos, this test statistic is also a random variable and will therefore also have a probability distribution function. Under the NHST, we first assume that the null hypothesis is true, and this assumption will decide the probability distribution for the test statistic. Together, we call it the null distribution, the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. And here's the key idea. Remember that a probability density function tells us what values are likely and unlikely for a given random variable. After we calculate our statistic, we'll see where it falls within this null distribution. If our test statistic looks unlikely in the null distribution, it implies that our original assumption that the null hypothesis was true is questionable and that we should reject it. And we'll see exactly how we judge a test statistic to be likely or unlikely later in the video. That's a lot of ground we covered there, but here are the essential ingredients that we need to keep track of. Population parameter, the null hypothesis, a test statistic that comes from actual data, and the null distribution of the statistic. We'll use the YouTube population as a running example for this video. In this case, our population parameter of interest is the average watch time. I came across an interesting graph about YouTube watch time a while ago. This analysis found that people watched YouTube for an average of 48.7 minutes in 2024. And this is amazing to me because we haven't even started 2024 yet, and yet they already know what's happened. So let's collect some data and see if their analysis holds some water. Because we're still in 2023, I'll use their estimate from this year and use it as our null hypothesis. Explicitly, our null hypothesis is that the average watch time a person watches YouTube is 47.5 minutes. Since we have the population parameter and the null hypothesis, we need to figure out a good test statistic and its null distribution. We've already mentioned that the sample mean x bar is a good guess for the population mean, so why don't we go with that? Hypothesis tests don't always use estimators as the test statistic, but this is what the one sample t-test uses. The last ingredient we need is the sampling distribution of the sample mean, since we'll need it to figure out the null distribution. Thanks to the central limit theorem, if we collect a lot of data, then the distribution of the sample mean will be approximately normal, where its mean is the population mean, and its variance is the population variance divided by the sample size. For the purposes of this video, we'll assume that all the assumptions of central limit theorem are valid. But if you need a refresher, you can refer back to the normal distribution training video. Instead of working with this form of the distribution, Statisticians prefer to work with the standardized distribution instead. To make sure that the test statistic has a standard normal distribution, we first subtract by the sample mean and divide this by the population standard deviation. We'll call this new standardized statistic Z, or a Z statistic. If you've taken a statistics course before, then you may recognize that these ingredients together form the Z test, a hypothesis test for the population mean based on the Z statistic. But the z-test has a glaring problem. Can you see it? To even calculate the z-statistic, you need to know both the population mean and the variance. While the null hypothesis will tell us what the population mean will be, we're still stuck with an unknown value for the variance. So how do we get around this? Instead of using the population variance, what if we replaced it with the sample variance? The sample variance is calculated via this equation, and I'll denote it as s squared. By replacing the population variance with the sample variance, we've got two things done. One, we've replaced an unknown value with something we can actually calculate from the data. And two, we replace a scalar value with the random variable. Remember, we also calculate the sample variance from the data, so it's also a random variable too. Therefore, this test statistic on the right is a really a function of two random variables instead of one. Intuitively, the incorporation of this second random variable adds extra uncertainty to the overall distribution of this statistic. That's cool and all, but it still doesn't tell us what the distribution of this function is. Thanks to the work of William Gossett and his work at Guinness, we have a name for this distribution, the student's T distribution, or just the T distribution. In a long list of frustrating notation choices by past statisticians, 
A T distribution is usually denoted by a lowercase t. The T distribution looks almost like a standard normal distribution, but has more density distributed towards the tails of the distribution. These are also known as fat tails, and they indicate that outliers are more likely in a T distribution than in a normal one. The shape of the PDF of a t-distribution actually changes with the sample size. Let's examine what happens to the t-distribution as our sample size increases. We can see that as the sample size grows, the t-distribution will come to resemble a standard normal more. Like the normal distribution, the t-distribution is also a parametric family, and the name of this parameter is the degrees of freedom. We won't get into it in this video, it's enough to know that the t-distribution is parameterized entirely by the sample size. So now we have all four ingredients needed to perform the one sample t-test under the NHST framework. Our test statistic is the t-statistic. The null distribution is a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Why is it n minus 1 and not n? In short, it's because we don't know the population mean and must use the sample mean to estimate the sample variance. We'll actually perform a one sample t-test using code. Instead of actually using the t-test function in R, we'll do it by hand. I'm trying to test the null hypothesis that the average time someone watches YouTube in 2023 is 47.5 minutes. I went out and asked 30 people how much YouTube they watch in a single day, which is what this array of numbers represents. Using this data, I'll first calculate the sample mean and sample variance, and then use these to construct my t-statistic. Under the null hypothesis, this t-statistic is distributed as a t-distribution with 29 degrees of freedom. 29 comes from the fact that I collected 30 observations and must subtract 1. Now, we need to see where test statistic falls within the null distribution. If this is the null distribution, then this is where the test statistic would fall. You can see it already looks unlikely. Instead of using just the density evaluated at the test statistic, Fisher computed the probability of observing the statistic we calculated, or something more extreme, and used this to judge the null hypothesis. This cumulative probability is the infamous p-value that many researchers are familiar with. We'll use the pt function to calculate this p-value, and we can see that it's very small. So we make our data-driven decision based on this p-value. If this p-value is small enough, then we can reject the null hypothesis. The test statistic we derive from the real world is unlikely to come from a world where the null distribution is true. So, based on the data we collected, we reject the null hypothesis that the average YouTube watch time is 47.5 minutes. But you may ask, what's small enough for a p-value? Fisher recommended a p-value of 0.05 as the cutoff, but also left it up to the researcher to decide what would be low enough. When the p-value is below 0.05, we see that the result is statistically significant, and this is where the word significance comes up in NHST. But what would have happened if the p-value was greater than 5%? We would say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the data we collected did not provide enough evidence to overturn it. Under the NHST, we don't support hypotheses. We can only reject them. Some of you may have questions. Isn't there a null hypothesis? What about confidence intervals? Fisher's contribution to the NHST was just the idea of the p-value, so I gave it the focus in this video. It was Jersey Neyman and Egan Pearson who extended the NHST to include the alternative hypothesis and confidence intervals, and we'll cover them more in detail when we cover the two sample t-tests. Hypothesis tests are an important tool for anyone who deals with data, but despite their framing as an introductory topic, there's deceptively many concepts one needs to be comfortable with before they really understand it. They're incredibly easy to misuse and understand. As employees of this company, I'll expect you to know more. Let's wrap up this video with the schema. This video introduces the Null Hypothesis Significance Testing Method, or NHST, and uses the one sample t-test as an example. A one sample problem refers to a research question that's concerned with one population, a group of interests. We typically can't observe the entire population so we perform statistical inference based on a smaller sample we can actually collect data from. The null hypothesis significance testing framework requires four things. A population parameter, a null hypothesis, a test statistic, and a distribution of the statistic assuming the null hypothesis is true. The key idea behind Fisher's idea of statistical significance is that you assume the null hypothesis to be true, 
collect data, and see how unlikely or unlikely the statistic is under the assumption. We calculate something called a p-value, which is the probability of observing a test statistic that is the same or more extreme than what we observe, given that the null hypothesis is true. If this p-value is small, then we should reject the null hypothesis because the data does not fit this assumption. We refer to this as statistical significance. Under the NHST, we can only reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is no such thing as supporting it. The one sample t-test is a hypothesis test for the population mean, and it's extremely useful because typical values or proportions are useful to know. We use a standardized version of the sample mean as our statistic. This is nice because the central limit theorem tells us what the sampling distribution of the statistic is. But because we don't usually know the value of the population variance, we replace it with the sample variance. And this has the effect of changing the distribution to a t-distribution, which is still bell-shaped, but has heavier tails compared to a normal distribution. Sign up for the employee newsletter before you clock out. I'll see you in the next one.